Well, I'm going to ask you to turn with, you, with me this morning back to uh, the book of Amos as we enter into the final section of this book. When we began this book, we said that the structure of Amos is largely split into two sections, uh, Amos's words in chapters 1 through 6, and then Amos's visions in chapters 7 through 9. We've seen his words already in chapters 1 through 6. We've seen his words of judgment against the nations. We've seen words of punishment for Israel's sins. We've seen words of condemnation for Israel's women and worship and stubbornness, words of woe regarding the people's pride and the people's self-deception. And we've been reminded over and over in these six chapters of the people's stubbornness and the people's sinfulness and the people's violation of their covenant with the Lord. We've seen that their way of life was marked by selfishness and exploitation and injustice from every turn. We've we've seen that their worship was marked by self-centeredness and hypocrisy and syncretism. And so the Lord has declared over and over through these six chapters that his judgment is coming. And so now we come in the final section this morning as we begin chapter 7, And we're going to see five different visions that Amos is going to uh, give. From chapter 7 through chapter 9, we're going to see five visions of what this judgment is going to look like. This morning, we're going to look at the first three. Amos chapter 7 here that we're going to look at this morning is, is a chapter that's dealing with the judgment of God upon sin that's based on the righteous standard of God's judgment alone. As I've titled our sermon this morning, as the sermon title suggests, God is making it clear this morning in Amos chapter 7 who the boss really is. He is the boss. He is in control. He is the ultimate authority. And all who do not measure up to his standard of righteousness must be prepared to stand on the side of his enemies on the day of judgment. So let's read together. I'm going to read all of chapter 7, and then we will walk through it this morning. Amos chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire, and it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. Then I said, O Lord God, please cease. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary. And it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Your wife shall be a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. And your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. And you yourself shall die in an unclean land. And Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. This passage, even in the reading of it, you probably uh, sensed and realized that the passage is split up into two very distinct 
sections. In, in the first nine verses, we see a series of three different visions that Amos lays out. And then beginning in verse 10 through the end, we enter into this dialogue between Amos and the priest Amaziah. And it may not appear readily to you this morning what the connection between these two are, but I hope that as we walk through the passage, you will see how that interchange between Amos and Amaziah is actually an illustration of the very things that Amos is saying in his first three visions. So let's look first at those, Amos's first three visions. Three times he begins these visions, verse 1, verse 4, verse 7, with these words, this is what the Lord God showed me. Now, this was Amos's way of making it clear to Israel that, listen, what I'm about to tell you is from the sovereign Lord himself. Amos was not hallucinating. He was not just daydreaming and seeing locusts and fire and a plumb line. He was not just a man from Judah out with a, a bone to pick against the northern people of Israel. Rather, he's making it clear that these visions were from God himself direct from Yahweh himself. The first vision that he presents is a vision of swarming locusts, a vision of swarming locusts. Verse one, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout and behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Now, if you've read through the prophets, you know that locusts were a common judgment of God upon his enemies. Uh, these locusts would come in and they would completely swarm and devastate crops, uh, causing all kinds of major agricultural damage, causing human misery, including famine and starvation. Uh, I read a, a National Geographic article about locusts. Listen, I, I, don't, I don't know what locusts look like. I haven't seen, I mean, I know what they look like, but I haven't seen a locust swarm right in our, uh, in our context here. But uh, this National Geographic article discussed how locust swarms still happen today. They happen all throughout Africa. They happen in the Middle East and Asia. And they said in this article that a locust swarm can be 460 square miles and within those miles, pack between 40 and million, 80 million locusts into each square mile. And each of these locusts, they said, can eat its weight in plants each day. So a swarm of that size could eat over 400 million pounds of plants a day. And so that's what Amos sees happening here. This locust swarm come in, completely ravage the country, completely ravage its crops. And two more bits of information that he says leads to even more disastrous effects. He says, when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout, and then he says it was after, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. What he's talking about here is some form of taxation that had taken place, some form of taxation where the king and his courts would get the, the first fruits, as it were, would get the first of the crops to make sure the king and all of his high courts were taken care of. And then that latter growth or that second growth would be that grain and those crops that would be stored for the whole season to come. And that was the last time that the crops would sprout forth between the next season. And so as Amos makes these two bits of information, he is making it clear that this would lead to complete devastation and starvation for the people. In fact, the people's very survival and their very future as a nation and a people would have been in question with such an ill-timed blow as this. It was difficult for us to imagine being on Amos's side and seeing this vision. Uh, seeing this vision of what the Lord was going to send to his people, what the Lord was going to send among Israel. But it was obviously so dreadful and so utter, utterly devastating that he goes to the Lord and he pleads to the Lord on behalf of them. Look at verse 2. He says, Oh Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. Now, this was not the nation's estimation of itself, was it? The, the nation of Israel thought themselves to be grand and, and unconquerable. They, 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 they relied on their strongholds and so forth. But in light of God's standard and God's perspective, Amos is saying what is true here. God, God before you, Jacob is so small. How can he stand if you send this? Amos is here reminding us as he pleads to the Lord, he's reminding us that the role of, of the prophet is not just one of representing God to the people as it is, but it's also often representing the people before God. 
You know, we see this often. We see it with Abraham in Genesis 20. We see Abraham called a prophet who will pray for the people. We even see him intercede for Sodom in Genesis 18. We see Moses plead for the people in intercessory prayer in Numbers 14. In 1 Samuel 7, we see Samuel intercede uh, before the Lord as the people suffered and as they turned away from God's will. And so Amos here, following this long line of prophets, he intercedes for the people. He hopes that God would relent of his plans for Israel. Now listen, he does not plead with God based on Israel's repentance, does he? Because as of yet, there was none. He does not plead with God based on Israel deserving anything, because no case could be made for that. Amos pleads with God based purely on his own mercy and grace. And we read in verse 3, the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. And the second, gro- the second vision that we see is almost identical to this, a vision of consuming uh, fire. This time Amos sees this, uh, another devastating judgment, not of locusts this time, but of this consuming fire so great that he says in verse 4, it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. Just like the locust, this was a judgment of absolute devastation upon the entire land, upon the entire country, upon the entire people. And so Amos again goes before the Lord, verse 5, O Lord God, please cease. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. And again, we read in verse 6, the Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. Now, before we move on to this third vision, how should we understand what's going on here? How should we understand in these six verses, verses, two visions, two times Amos prays to the Lord, and two times it says the Lord relented? How how are we to understand this and make sense of this? Well, listen, this is a large topic that we could easily spend an entire sermon on. We could probably spend an entire series on. It's a question that we often have from passages like this. God says he's going to do something. Somebody prays, and then the Lord says, I I relent of that. It comes to us in, in Exodus as Moses pleads for the people after the golden calf incident, and many others like it. We don't have time to dive deeply into the topic and give a full orb treatment, but let me just offer a few things by way of reminder so that we would have a theological and a biblical grid to understand passages like this, and I think it will help us in that way. Two things I have there on your handout. First, we must begin with this reminder that God is sovereign, God is eternal, and God does not change his mind in the way we think of changing our mind. When you and I think of changing our mind, it's it's often or always in the category we have planned to do one thing, Some new information comes that we did not previously have, and so now we change our mind thinking a better course of action is is to be made. Well, that's not the case with God, is it? God is eternal. God is omniscient. God is sovereign. He has ordained all things that come to pass. So he never learns new things, and he never has to reconsider the best course of action. We have to start with that reminder that God is sovereign, he is omniscient, and he is eternal. But coupled with that, we must also recognize and remember that God has ordained not only the ends, what will happen, but also the means, how those things will come to pass. As such, God can and God does really actually respond to the prayers of his people. Because he responds to the prayers of his people does not negate his sovereignty one bit. We see these twin truths running throughout the Old and the New Testaments both, that God is 100% sovereign over all things and that human actions actually really matter and that God listens to and responds to the prayers of his people. And that's exactly what's happening here in Amos chapter 7. Another important thing to note, I think, here is that God did not change his mind here. Rather, he changed his course of action. You see, God will always ultimately judge sin. Nothing has changed about that here. God's relenting here then when it comes to judgment is no change in his mind as to whether or not he's really going to have a standard of righteousness and whether or not he's really going to judge sin. Rather, he's being consistent with his justice and that he will ultimately punish sin 
while also at the same time being consistent to demonstrate to his people the oppor- that, that he loves to give them an opportunity to repent. And he, he's showing himself to be the very things he's declared to be in Exodus 34, 6, two chapters after, if you remember, in Exodus 32, when Moses prays to the Lord, uh, the Lord relents of what he was going to bring upon Israel. And two chapters later, we read the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You see, we have to remember these truths, that God is a just God who will punish sin. God is also a merciful God and a gracious God who is ready to forgive any and all who would turn from their sin and turn to him. These are those twin truths that we see running through Amos 7 here. Indeed, these are these twin truths that we see running throughout God's word and culminating in the very gospel message itself. You see, in the cross of Christ himself, where, where that place where mercy and justice perfectly meet. We see these twin truths meet right there at the cross of Christ, where at the cross, God showed the seriousness of sin and the requirements of justice, didn't he? As sin could not be simply forgiven by word or pardon. God could not look at us as sinners and just say, you know what, it's okay, I forgive you. Let's just let bygones be bygones. He could not do that. Sin demanded payment. And on the cross, Jesus goes and he takes that wrath of the Father for the sins of his people. He goes and he sacrifices a substitute for all of those who would trust in him and believe in him by faith. At the cross, we see the seriousness of sin and we see the requirements of justice. But also at the cross, don't we see the lavishness of God's love and mercy? Not love and mercy for those who deserved it, but for those who did not deserve it in the slightest. Romans 5, for while we were still sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. Listen, God did not have to make a way of salvation. He did not have to call a people for himself. It was out of sheer grace and mercy that he chose to provide the spotless lamb and to call sinners like you and me into relationship with himself through the regenerating work of the spirit and the substitutionary work of the son. That's what Amos 7 here in the first two visions is putting this on display in a, in a slight sense that God is a God of justice. But God is also a God of mercy. And listen, God's word does not emphasize one of these truths to the exclusion of the others, nor does God's word pit these two things against each other as enemies. And I think we have to be careful that we don't do that either. That brings us then to the third vision. We've seen the vision of the locust, the vision of the fire. Now we see thirdly in verses 7 through 9 a vision of a, of a revealing plumb line. Look at verse 7 with me again. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuary of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. You know, as, as I'm reading this, this third vision almost feels like the third strike in a baseball game. You know, the Lord's relented of his judgment twice, and here Israel has one last chance to hit, so to speak, right? One last chance, one last opportunity to repent of their sin. But then we come to this vision, and Israel has struck out. The Lord will withhold his judgment no more. This third vision features this revealing plumb line. Now, I'm Sure, many of you are much more familiar with a plumb line than I am. Uh, But in case you're not, a plumb line is made of this stone or this metal weight attached to the end of a cord. And it's it's a tool that builders use to measure the straightness of a wall, the the vertical straightness of a wall or not, to see if it's perfectly straight. Well, in this instance, what the Lord is doing, the Lord is the builder, and he is measuring Israel to see if she meets his approval, to see if she meets the standards of his righteousness. God is pictured here standing by the wall with a plumb line. It's Amos is a way of saying that God is about to check Israel to see if the nation is as upright as it claims to be. Even though the Lord has shown mercy to his people, listen, he still holds them accountable, doesn't he? He still holds them accountable to the standards of righteousness and justice of his covenant that he established 
with them. And we know from the first six chapters that Israel is going to fail this test miserably. Like a wall that was once straight and began to look to be crooked and in disrepair, so the nation of Israel had become. You know what's interesting here? You notice something's missing, isn't it? Something's missing from the first two visions. The first two visions, we see the vision and then we see what happened. Amos prays and the Lord relents. The second vision, the vision is given. Amos prays and the Lord relents. But here in the third vision, you have no appeal by Amos. You have no prayer. You have no intercession. God's people must prepare to stand before the perfect standard of God and be judged accordingly. There was no appeal for such judgment. And so in light of their failure to pass the test, verse 9, we see uh, three pronouncements of judgment on three things, the high places of Isaac, the sanctuaries of Israel, and the house of Jeroboam. You could say here that the Lord is bringing judgment upon two institutions, the two institutions which the nation depended on the most, Israel's religion and Israel's monarchy. Their reliance on the faith of their forefathers is going to come crashing down. They will not be protected from the Lord's wrath simply because they go to sacred places and offer perfunctory prayers and offerings. Their abominable sanctuaries that were a syncretistic blend of supposed worship of Yahweh mixed with worship of other gods in the land would be no more. They will fully and finally realize that you come to God on his terms or not at all. And secondly, we'll see, we see the monarchy would fall. This sign of Israel's pride and security would be no more. They would no longer be able to find their sense of peace and security in their supposed strongholds and their fortifications and their superior military. Uh, Jeroboam and Israel were not going to experience the Lord coming in peace as they thought they would. They were going to experience the Lord coming to wage war. And so that leads us now to... Verse 10, into this dialogue, Amos' dialogue with Amaziah. And here we have this vivid portrayal of who the boss really is. Now on the surface, as you're reading, if you read chapter 7 through chapter 9, on the surface, as you go vision after vision after vision, this narrative seems to break it up a bit. And, and you're left asking, how does this fit in with the rest of these visions? But I think it functions significantly to illustrate the two main reasons for Israel's fall is government, represented by King Jeroboam, and its misguided religion, represented by the priest Amaziah. It particularly illustrates here the hardened attitudes of the religious leaders to the word of the Lord, and it shows why God could spare them no longer. You see the central issue in verses 10 through 17 in this encounter between Amos and Amaziah, the central issue centers here around uh, the topic of authority. Who is in charge of the people of Israel? Who set the ultimate standard? To whom were the people ultimately subject? Well, we see three things, three people that are not their ultimate authority. First, we see that the king is not their ultimate authority. Look at verse 10 as the narrative begins. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. We're introduced here to Amaziah, this priest of Bethel. And apparently Amaziah had a direct ear of the king. And so he goes to the king and he speaks of this troublemaker named Amos. And essentially he is claiming, he's accusing Amos here of high treason and insurrection and a conspiracy to remove the king from the throne. He says here, he appeals to the king at the end of verse 10, the land is not able to bear his words. You see, the prophet's message had gone forth into the entire land of Israel and it was not settling well. As the old saying go, a hit, goes, a hit dog barks. And that's exactly what's happening here. As Amos' message has gone out into all of Israel, it was not settling well with the people because they knew what he was saying was true. And so the people in the land, all the way up to the priests and of the illegitimate people and the, and the king himself had heard the rumblings of this prophet's message. And Amaziah is pleading with the king, Jeroboam, you have to do something about this. But listen, here's the thing. Nothing could be done. Try as he may, 
No one, including the king, could stop the message of God's judgment upon sin, of God's using this plumb line of perfect righteousness as the standard to examine the people. One commentator puts it like this. He said, Amos' words have already penetrated the defenses of Bethel and Israel, and it's already too late to do anything about them. The leaders may silence Amos now and forever, but the damage has begun and will increase. You see, the king could do nothing about this message of God's judgment coming upon the people's sin because the king was not their ultimate authority. And secondly, we're reminded in this interchange that the priest is not their ultimate authority. Verse 12, Am- Amaziah takes upon himself to run the prophet out of town. He says, O seer, go fly away to the land of Judah. Eat bread there, prophesy there, but never again prophesy at, at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary. And it is a temple of the kingdom. Amaziah now sets himself up as this ultimate authority, putting it upon himself above the prophet and above the word of the Lord to try to run this prophet out of town. He tells Amos to go home, not just go home, but he tells him to go home quickly, flee away. Uh, Another translation of that could be run for your life. Get back to Judah. Now listen, you can prophesy all you want there. Go make your living there. Go prophesy there. Go tell them all about these supposed visions that you want. But don't do this here in Israel anymore. Don't let these visions and these words of judgment come upon the king's sanctuary. You know, what's ironic about Amaziah here, and what's ironic about Amaziah's response to Amos, is that all all he's doing is authenticating everything Amos has already proclaimed about Israel's king and the religious establishment. It was corrupt. It was hypocritical. And it was in direct opposition to the authoritative word of the Lord. This plumb line in Amos' vision is showing to just be proven to be accurate simply by his response. So we see the king is not the ultimate authority. The priest is not the ultimate authority. Thirdly, we see the prophet is not their ultimate authority. Amos makes it abundantly clear to Amaziah here that Amos himself is nothing special. It's not because of how great he is or how special he is that he's saying the things he's saying. Look at verse 14. He makes it clear. I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. In other words, I wasn't born for this. I wasn't seeking this. I was minding my own business, working as the Lord had called me to. Verse 15, but the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. As we said, as we introduced this book and introduced this man, Amos, he was a shepherd. He was a herdsman. He was a dresser of sycamore figs. He was a normal, ordinary man. He had no theological training. He did not come from a prophet's family and just following in line with the family business. He was minding his own business. He was engaged in the work and task the Lord had called him to, and the Lord calls him to this task. But Amos the prophet was not their ultimate authority either. If the words were his alone, they would carry zero weight. They would be useless. They would be just another opinion by an ordinary man. So it's made clear here the the king is not the authority, the priest is not the authority, the prophet is not the authority. Rather, Amos makes it clear here, the Lord is their ultimate authority. I love how Amos responds at the end of this interchange, verse 16. After they go back and forth here, Amaziah tries to lead him out of town. Amos responds, listen, it's not me. The Lord's called me to this. I love what he says in verse 16. Boldly, with no apology, with no hesitation, now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You know, Amos had a, had a choice to make in this episode, a choice that all of us will have to make at some point and often many points in our life. Was he going to stand firm on the word and the authority of the Lord alone? Or was he going to bow to lesser authorities that sought to take that place of ultimate authority? He made his choice clear and he declares, hear 
the word of the Lord. And now he pronounces judgment once again. He reaffirms the judgment, not only on the nation of Israel, but now specifically to Amaziah himself. He says, verse 16, you say, don't prophesy against Israel. Don't preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided with, with a measuring line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land. And listen, just in case you were wondering, Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. You know, as we consider this passage this morning in Amos 7, as we consider these three visions, as we consider this interchange between the prophet and the priest, I think we come face to face with this question of authority. Who is ultimately in charge? Who is ultimately the boss? And Amos' vision of the plumb line offers us this vivid reminder that God himself is ultimately in charge, that God is the ultimate standard of right and wrong, and that God will judge by his standards and no one else's. You see, the difficulty, though, is that we often do not think as God thinks, do we? Rather, we're constantly tempted to measure ourselves by other human standards rather than by God's standard of perfection. It's kind of like a illustration I read this week. Imagine with me a class of children who are about to receive an art lesson from their teacher. The first step in this lesson is for them to draw a straight line on the left side of the sheet of paper. But before the teacher can give further instructions about how to do this, the principal comes by and calls the teacher out of the classroom. And while the teacher's gone, the students are sitting around just kind of twiddling their thumbs, thinking what to do. And they begin to try the lesson on their own. So they all draw lines and they're trying to draw the straightest line that they can. They, they draw lines and then they begin to compare their lines by each other. And Johnny's is clearly straighter than Philip's, but Sally's is clearly straighter than Johnny's. But listen, Mary has the straightest line of all. And so all the kids begin comparing their lines by Mary's line to judge how straight theirs is and how crooked another's is. And it's at that point that the teacher comes back in the room. She sees what the children have done. And then she expresses that, listen, she did not want a freely drawn line. She wanted a perfectly straight line drawn with a ruler. So she goes around to each child's paper and she draws this perfectly straight line on the paper. And it becomes very clear that every single line in the room is crooked, including Mary's. You see, this is the effect of having our lives evaluated by God's plumb line. Before God steps in, the lines we have drawn by making small ethical decisions in our life, they seem fairly straight. They seem good and right in our own eyes. And then we compare ourselves to one another, and we often compare ourselves to people worse than us, and it makes us feel really good about ourselves. And we're feeling pretty righteous. We're feeling pretty good because they're far worse than we are. We rate ourselves highly, but then God steps in, doesn't he? And we all look crooked. It's abundantly clear that none of us measure up to that perfectly straight line. You see, God has a perfect standard of righteousness. His word perfectly reveals his will for us as his people, and it's clear from beginning to end that none of us measure up to it. We are all found wanting. We are all found to be less than perfect. You see, this is the problem with appealing to God's justice in our life. Many people think that all they want from God is his justice. They read passages like this and say, God, it is not right for you to judge with locusts and fire. Some of these people are better than others. We demand you take that into account. That is not right of you, God. That is not fair. That is not just. And God says, okay, fine. You know, we'll... we'll, we'll We'll see who really measures up to being good. And so he sends the perfect plumb line, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, listen, this is what's good. Who measures up to that? And of course, no one does. We are all condemned. You see, an appeal to justice will save no one. The very last thing you and I want as sinners before God is his justice. The very last thing you want is for him to be fair. And justice for our sin is hell. Justice for our sin is wrath. It's the very thing that each one of us outside of Christ will experience. We are all sinners. There is none righteous. No, not one. 
But as we've said earlier, even today, the good news of the gospel is that God did provide a way of salvation, a way where if we would forget our pride, if we would abandon our arrogance, if we would look to God not for justice, but look to him for mercy, we will find that in Christ, God has provided a substitute, a way of salvation to be made right with him. And so I ask you to ask yourself this morning. I did the wrong one, but I ask you to ask yourself this morning. Who's the boss? To whom or what do you look for ultimate authority? Amos reminds the Israelites here in chapter 7 of these truths, and so we must be reminded today. The king, the political rulers, those in positions of earthly authority, listen, they are not the ultimate boss. They have been put in place by God to serve with a purpose, no doubt, but they are not the ultimate boss. And looking to them for protection, for protection on that day of judgment will offer no help and no solution. The religious establishment, they are not the boss. Going through the empty motions, engaging in heartless sacrifices, trying to earn God's favor through mere religiosity will offer no protection on that day of judgment. The one true triune God, Yahweh, the creator of the universe, eternally God in three persons. He is the boss. He is the only ultimate authority. It is against him we have sinned, and it is to him we must answer. And listen, it is in him that we can find forgiveness through the finished work of Christ on the cross. I pray this morning that each of us would see these truths, that each of us would see the punishment for sin as what it is, realize that that day of judgment that Amos is prophesying here and that we know is coming is really coming and that we would look to Christ alone for forgiveness and reconciliation. And what a wonderful reminder that is for us this morning as we prepare our hearts now to come and to partake of the bread, to partake of the cup that remind us of these precious truths that God sent his son, perfect, righteous, blameless, spotless, to take our place, to break his body and to shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. I'm going to lead us in prayer. I'm going to ask as I pray for our men to come this morning as we prepare to take of the supper together.